really a special passage tonight, 1 John chapter 3, very special passage because it really makes us think about some things that are really remarkable, things that uh, I think the Bible calls a mystery, the mystery of godliness is how the God uh, sent His Son uh, into the flesh, but it's also a mystery of salvation that God makes a whole new body of believers, and it's not limited to Jews, it's, it's uh, comprised of Jew and Gentile alike. But it's a mystery that God makes us sons. In chapter 3 and verse 1, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. But we shall see Him as He is, and every man that hath this hope in Him purifieth himself even as he is pure. This is a passage on the absolute marvel of sonship. The absolute marvel of sonship. You think about it, I, I don't know about you, but I wonder about in the Old Testament when Joseph uh, went down to Egypt first, then his father and his brothers moved down there as well. It says only about one, maybe two sisters that they ever had. You know they had more sisters than that. I mean, the birth rate is pretty, you know, it's not 50-50, but there must have been some other daughters. There, are a whole, there must have been some daughters. There, there's a whole bunch of people that probably aren't listed in your Bibles. And yet the Bible speaks so much of sons, not to neglect the women, not at all, because we're all children of God by adoption. But, but there's something special when Joseph, when, um, when, uh, uh, Jacob was giving his blessings to his sons. He said, Reuben, you're the beginning of my strength. And that's what a son is. Your firstborn son is the beginning of your strength. And what a joy it is. In fact, uh, it, uh, allegedly, well, the Bible says that when a woman gives birth to a son, before long she forgets the pain she went through. That's why it's women that give birth to sons, not men, because men wouldn't forget that. But um, she rejoices, doesn't she, because a boy, a, a man is born into this world. There's something special about sonship, and it was to be a son that was given, Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. It's a son that's given, and God says that when, you're, when you trust Christ as Savior, He adopts you into His family as a son. That's why this passage is on the marvel of sonship, that we are adopted into His family uh, as joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Isn't that an incredible thought? That's absolutely stunning. It's absolutely incredible, but we'll look at the marvel of sonship. Let's pray. Lord, just bless this time together. Father, I pray that you give me words to think and speak. Lord, that you might be in and about everything that's said and done tonight, that you might glorify yourself. Lord, just bless us. Help us to put the cares away from us this, uh, for these moments and let your word dwell in us richly. In Jesus' name, amen. Well... <clears throat> There's this whole passage in chapter 2. It says, He writes unto you fathers and sons and children. He writes unto them as a family, and there is a sweet family of God, isn't there? That's why I was talking to someone. I was at the restaurant the other day with a preacher, and, and the girl came up, and I said, You know, I can't remember your name. I've seen you several times. And she told me, and then I said, That's why you should be a Baptist, because we just call each other brother and sister, and if you forgot the name, it doesn't matter. We're all, but we do that because we're all sons of God by adoption, aren't we? Brother and sister, and when you're not used to that, it sounds a little strange, but that's what we are. It's a family of God, aren't we? And there are close family references in this passage, but um, we understand this. Salvation, we could have been saved without being becoming sons of God, couldn't we? I mean, the Old Testament doesn't say so much sonship. I can't think of a verse that it does. Uh, we didn't have to be sonship. Think about the honor that God gave to us by simple faith in Jesus Christ. He adopts us into His family as joint heirs with His dear, precious Son, Jesus Christ. That's incredible because it says what manner of love the Father. He didn't have to show His love that way. He didn't have to. But His love adopted as children and uh, children of the Heavenly Father. The world doesn't see us as children of God. The world sees us as no different than any other man, woman, boy, or girl. But Jesus made the world, and the world didn't know Him. The Bible says in John 1, 10, that go back to the Gospel of John chapter 1 and verse 10, because it's the same author through inspiration. That is, the Apostle John writes this. I don't think he ever got over this whole uh, concept either. But John chapter 1 and verse 10, it says this, 
and I take time to get there. It says this, um, he was in the world and the world was made by him. Isn't that interesting? He was in the world and the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. The world didn't acknowledge him as, this, as not only not the Savior, they didn't acknowledge him as the creator. And he was both the creator of the heavens and the earth and the Savior of mankind. So why would we be expecting that the world would acknowledge us? They find us to be really an enemy, an obstacle. That's one of the reasons I wasted money on uh, Al Gore's book. He said that Christians are the obstacle to the environmental movement. Thank you. Praise the Lord for that. Christians are an obstacle because we don't just swallow the baloney they give us. We just don't swallow it. So Jesus made the world, but the world didn't know him. And the intimate knowledge that John had of Jesus Christ displays everything there is to know about Jesus as God, doesn't it? It displays that openly to us, that Jesus was the very God of creation, the very God of gods. So the marvel of sonship. First of all, notice this. The old manner of love the Father hath bestowed. There are not words to describe the love of God. There aren't words to describe. I mean, uh, Art has to hurry home Sunday night so that he can see uh, whatever that, as the stomach churns. What is that program you're, huh? Hallmark, yeah. It's, just, it's the very same, because I have to confess, I've seen a few of them. It's the very same um, plot in every one of them. Some beautiful girl has a dingbat for a, a fiancé, and she runs into a guy that's really a great guy. He's actually a man. Now they're changing that too, but uh, he's actually manly. And so they have to arrange it so that the dingbat girl falls in love with a guy and dumps the idiot, the, the idiot. It's always the same, isn't it? It's always the same. And they call that love. They always make a saccharine love story because basically people are saps. Primarily maybe with women, but, you know, we're saps for a good love story, aren't we? Aren't we? But then he says, behold, what manner of love. What manner of love. You know, when you look at a program like that, and Art doesn't manage to get home too often in time for that, but um, um, when you look at a story like that, we, we object to it because you see this pretty woman and a complete idiot for a guy. And you wonder, what did she see? And I, we understand what he saw in her. At least outwardly, she's pretty, okay? And God's love is so contrary to that. It's while we were sinners he died for us. It's nothing like this world's love story. It's while we were the filth and offscouring of this world that Jesus said, I'd like to have fellowship with them. I'd like for them to spend eternity with me. And the only way he could do so was sending his son to take upon him the sins of the world and die in our place. Behold what manner of love. Behold is a great and powerful word, isn't it? Look at this. Look at this. Look at what kind of love the Father has for us. The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And I like those words as well. He didn't just love the world. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Isn't that an incredible verse? He loved this world. He tells us not to be friends with the world, but he loved this world enough to pluck some out of this world. And we love that and we rejoice in that. That's the Father's love. He loved the world so that he could give us redemption. And that day of redemption says there's rejoicing in the midst of the angels of God. I suspect all of heaven rejoices when someone passes from death to life, don't you? I suspect there's rejoicing everywhere as people respond to the offer of salvation. Romans 5 tells us, He saved us while we were yet sinners. And you'll find the devil's lies in all of this. The devil will tell you God didn't love you. He doesn't love you. He doesn't have any obligation. No, he doesn't have an obligation to love us. But he does. Isn't it amazing that with all the power at God's disposal, with all the creativity in his mind, with all the brilliance of his behavior, when you look at his causes for rejoicing, when Moses asked to see his glory, it was mercy and grace. It was mercy and grace. Exodus 32, I think it is. Mercy and grace. 
we don't deserve the goodness of God. That's what's amazing is people will live having been saved, being glad that they're saved and they don't give God anything to do with their life. And yet you're going to regret one day not surrendering earlier. Everyone does. Everyone does. We're given so many minutes in so many hours of so many days in this life. And why not give them all back to him? He loved the world. He saved us while we were sinners. He sent his son to die for us when we had the revolting character of sin all about us. What a terrible thing. And yet it's so wonderful that he saved us while we were sinners. Another lie that the devil tells you is you're too bad to come to Jesus. You've heard that. If you've told people about Jesus, they'll tell you that, well, I couldn't come. I'm just too far gone. There's no way. That's who he died to save, isn't it? He died to save sinners. He's, as one of the ladies used to sing, he's filling up heaven with sinners. I'll be glad to be in heaven with sinners redeemed. And they're still glorying in the fact that they're in heaven and not in hell. I don't mean that it's a surprise to us. But if, when the Bible says, I hath not seen, neither has ear heard, what is entered in, neither has entered into the heart of man, what God has prepared for them that love him, we're going to be stunned by what heaven looks like, aren't we? I have no doubt about that. And then we'll be rejoicing that God has brought us all the way home. Won't that be wonderful? Well, he saved us while we were sinners. The Bible says what love he's bestowed upon us, he gave it to us. That's another uh, th th these three verses show us that salvation is not by works. It's not something we earn. It's something that's granted and given freely. It's because of the love of God. And you can look at all these things. And by the way, it's not a process. He's given us eternal life. Isn't it wonderful? The day you ask Jesus to save you from that day on, not only are you a son of God, but you are eternally kept and secure. You'll one day be in heaven. One day, be in heaven. It bothers me to see how the devil lies to people, and we see that in 2 Corinthians 4, where he, our gospel is hid, I think it was last Sunday night, is hid to them that are lost, whom the devil has blinded their minds. Whether people say, oh, you had a profession when you were, you never got saved. And I mean, you can't get saved when you're, I wouldn't talk someone out of it. But they, the devil knows that if you're saved, he's going to convince you you're not. If you're not saved, he's going to convince you you are. Isn't that what he's going to do? He's af After all, he's anti-Christ. He wants to destroy our lives. But he bestowed that upon us. And the glory of it all is that we're sons. That we're sons. I've often thought about this, and, and I know I've said it many times, that my earliest memories of my dad, I remember buying a Studebaker pickup. I remember going to Studebaker uh, dealerships and seeing the new Studebakers that came out. Maybe that's why I still like Studebakers, okay? Dr. Phil Schuler accused me of driving a Studebaker one time. I said, yeah, I'd, I'd drive a Studebaker. I would happily. Um, I remember seeing all those days, but I remember the first job I went to be with him. He was the bus driver for the Okanagan School District. He got pins every year for driving safe. Another year, no problems. And, uh, but he was also the mechanic for the bus garage. And I'd go down there and follow my dad around pretty much like William follows Jonathan around. I don't know about you grandfathers out there, but whenever one of the grandkids says, Dad, I always look up because I still kind of feel like I'm dad, okay? I'd follow my dad around and do everything he did, and I'd try to get dirtier than he was. I'd try to make more of a mess than he did. I'd try to be in the middle of everything that was going on because I wanted to be near my dad. But as you get older and the world has more of a pull on you. It might be harmless friends. It might be just the entertainment of this world. Then the distance grows between you and your earthly father, and that's what's happening today spiritually. The day you got saved, you were so thrilled that you were adopted into God's family, and you knew it was palpable that the burden was lifted when you came to the cross. The burden was lifted. The burden you've been bearing all those years was gone. You knew you were a new creature, even though you didn't know that verse yet. But then the world comes back to haunt you. And all too often, that world just robs us of our joy and our peace. And just like a child 
outgrows the sweet time of fellowship he has with his dad, and it doesn't maybe get back to them until they get a little older, till selfishness is, they've grown out of, or maybe been disciplined out of. But then that fellowship is sweet and restored once again. That's the way, that's why God calls us sons. That's why he declares us to be sons. That's why the whole image of sonship is there. All of these things, because we can understand that. We can understand it. And so as sons, the mystery of godliness is that God was manifest in the flesh. That the mystery of godliness in 1 Timothy 3.15 is, 3.16 is that God was born as a man. I still revel every time I think about that. When Jesus was talking with a woman at the well, the creator of the heavens and the earth was talking to that woman. He knew her every thought, knew her background, knew everything about her, knew exactly what to say, knew exactly what her fears, and, and you can look at what she said, how she responded. It's the exact same way that people respond today. They will divert you with some loaded question, just like she did, and he brought her back because he cared for her, brought her back and brought her back until she went into the town and said, you need to come and hear this guy. He told me all I'd ever done. Is not this the Christ? The mystery of godliness, that God walked on this earth. God walked on his own creation. Amazing, isn't it? The gospel, Ephesians 6, 9, that God would die for man. That God would die for man. When, when uh, you look at Isaiah 53, who hath believed our report? The gospel's unbelievable. Uh, really, you look, you tell someone on the streets, you tell them that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, came to earth as a former man. We know him as Jesus Christ. They'll look at you like you're nuts. Why is that? Because it's a mystery of godliness, isn't it? He, uh, God would come into this life and God himself would die like a man dies. He would die like a man dies. Colossians 1.27, that Christ then would indwell the redeemed believer. Think about that. That Christ in you, the hope of glory, you know what my joy is? Doesn't matter how fast or how far the world goes south, my hope is one day to stand in His presence. And I'm not hoping I'm able to make it. It's the thing that gives you hope. It's that vision before you that thrills your soul and carries you through dark times and hard times. Isn't that true? Now, that we would be adopted as sons is the marvel of the love of God. Adopted as sons. Sons. Who could have enough sons? My grandmother Bergstrom had eight sons. One of them died as an infant, and one was killed in the war. And six of them lived, and I knew them all. I knew them all. She also had seven daughters. And I knew all of, no, one of them died as a baby. One of them died as a baby. So I knew all six daughters. I knew all of them, and one or two are still living. And I just know that I always, I, I used to say, I, I, I shouldn't say this in public, but I always missed my uncles. I didn't miss my aunts so much. We weren't close like them. There's something about my uncles. They were all different. They would make you laugh your head off, and they'd be laughing with you. And then one of my uncles, who was my favorite, he would, if he ever just smirked, you'd be holding your sides and rolling in the aisle. He had such a dry sense of humor. He was delightful to be around. And they were all different. And the Bible says God adopts us into his family as sons. There's a place of authority there, isn't there? There's a place of favor there. There's a place of strength there. My dad would tell stories of his oldest brother, John, who would just back up to a cast iron bathtub pick it up and walk upstairs. Now, those are 300 pounds. I don't know. John was a big guy. They were all big guys. I remember stories of him. I remember stories of my Uncle Donald, who the mule kicked him one time, and he says Donald was about 6'2". He looked at his arm that was bleeding, and he kicked that mule in the high end, and he said well, you could just about see light underneath his hooves. He kicked it just about off the ground for kicking him. The stories that kids remember, 
the stories that kids remember. And that last letter my Uncle Donald wrote to my dad that I had in my possession for years, he says, Dwight, we're gonna, I'll be coming home. I think he's five years older. I'll be coming home. We're going to go fishing. We're going to catch fish. And a short time later, he perished in World War II. The Bible says he adopts us as sons, and you have great memories of uncles, great memories, not to diminish the aunts, not to diminish them at all, but the son is the place of authority and privilege, isn't it? Well, we're adopted as sons. The world didn't know him. The world doesn't know us. So you see the love of God, and you could preach more than one message just on the love of God. Why would he love me? Why would he love me? You've led people to Christ. I know when Al led his own dad to Christ, his dad's first words, you know what they were? Why would he love me? That's a marvelous thing, isn't it? That's a marvelous thing. Secondly, look at the motive behind God's love. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The motive for God's love, we are his sons right now. We are his sons. We have the authority, and that's the position of authority. We have the authority to come boldly to the throne of grace because we're sons. You know your sons, your grandsons. My grandson runs me out of my office. Quite often I'll realize that my desk is occupied. You don't just let anyone do that, do you? Sons have a place, a special place of authority, don't they? And we are sons right now. Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection, Romans 1.4. But we are sons of God by adoption, aren't we? They tell me legally, I'm not a lawyer, but the adoption uh, relationship is even more legally binding than natural birth. Isn't that interesting? Now, how does that possibly happen when folks would tell you the Bible's not true, and yet even the natural law follows the very words of Scripture? We're adopted. He'll never forsake us, never leave us, never leave us. Well, we'll be like Him when we see Him as He is. When we see Him as He is, we'll be like Him. So far, we follow Him by faith. Haven't had eyes to see Him. People say, well, Jesus appeared to me. Maybe something appeared to you, okay? Most of the time when you see Jesus appearing to people, he had long hair. He didn't have long hair. Or blonde hair. He didn't have blonde hair, okay? According to the Song of Solomon, his hair was black like a raven, okay? Uh, but they have some image in their head, what, you know, whatever it was. But we'll see him as he is then. What kind, how would you describe that? See, if I had the ability of an artist, I would never paint God on the throne. I would never paint Jesus ever because I don't see how I could be anything but sacrilegious in doing so. But one day we'll see him as he is. That means we'll be able to look upon him. We'll be able to look upon him when Spurgeon got saved. He got saved out of that passage, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. And he said, it occurred to me. I just had to look. I didn't have to earn anything. I didn't have to clean up. I just had to look, and I've spent the rest of my life, life looking at him, looking to drink in every view I could get of him. But then that day, we'll see him as he is. We'll see him probably, I mean, undoubtedly still with the wounds that were bought at Calvary, won't we? But we'll see him as he is. Most likely, that means our image of him isn't the same as what he really is. But we'll see him in full holiness. We'll see him in full glory. When he came to this earth, his glory was masked to a certain extent. When he came the first time, he came as a lamb, and a lamb is obedient, and a lamb is tender and gentle and all that. But when he comes back, he'll come as a lion. And a lion, I suspect, I suspect a lion, if you were out in the jungle and a lion roared behind you, there'd be all kinds of dancing on your spine going up and down, don't you think? You'd think, I hope he's not hungry. I hope he doesn't want an hors d'oeuvre about the size of me. When he comes back, it'll be the lion. We saw him through a, a glass darkly, but when he comes back, when we see him in heaven, it'll be in the full 
spectrum of His glory. I can't even describe in my mind, I can't imagine in my mind what that must be like. And yet we're joined hairs with Him. He adopts, God the Father adopts us as sons. We'll be like Him. Then we'll see Him by sight. When He appears, same verse. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. It doesn't say if He appears. It says when He appears. When He appears. He's going to come back one day, or you'll die and go to heaven one day, and when you see Him, you'll see Him as He really is, won't you? We have images in our mind. The Bible says when we see Him in Isaiah 53, there's no beauty that we would desire Him. God didn't uh, send His Son to take upon Him um, the form of, a, of an Adonis. He was more powerful than any man ever before or since. But there's no beauty that we desire. You can say, well, that lack of beauty is because uh, He has the wounds in His hands and His side and His feet. He's got the blood down His face and all that. But I think it's more than that. I think that He's one that folks would often overlook even before the damage. That's just a thought of mine. But one day we'll see him as he is. And the glory that surrounds the resurrected and exalted Christ will stun us though we're looking forward to seeing him. I have no doubt it'll stun us. Remember, in heaven, there's no need for the sun there. The S-U-N. Why? Because the brilliance of God in his presence is going to be all the light we need. All the light we need. We'll be there in the midst of light. We'll be there with a water, tree of life. We'll be there with a river of water of life that proceeds from the throne. And those are the elements of life. And just like children, who did, I was one of those kids who didn't want to go to take a nap for anything. I don't know about the rest of you, but I hated naps. You were waiting, you were wasting minutes precious minutes of every day and it was absolutely necessary to take that nap, William. I didn't like taking naps. Now I like taking naps. But you know what? We didn't want to waste the daylight in heaven. It's still the same day every saint ever experienced when he got there because there's no night there. Just think of a an unending experience. An unending experience. I don't know what all is going to happen there because it does say it's obscured to us. But we know this, and probably that's all we need to know, that the glory of His presence is there. He'll be there. And like Spurgeon says, I'll drink in His vision. I, I, I never quit looking. And what they said of Spurgeon compared to the orators of their day was, they might say of hearing the orators what a great speaker he was. Of Spurgeon, they always said what, how much he loved his Savior, what a great God he served. That's what we want. We want to point men to Jesus, don't we? When he appears, we'll be like him. That day we'll see him as he wants us to be. We'll see him in the way he wants us to be. And that's covered in verse 3. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. That's the ministry that proceeds from the love of God. The Father wants Jesus to have a whole host of brethren. A whole host of brethren. The ministry of the love of God is that we'll all be there with him. There is the imminence of accounting, isn't there? When you're a kid, have you ever, do you remember walking home from school trying to remember to forget something? Am I the only one that did that? Honestly, I forgot. I worked really hard at forgetting that, okay? You would do that because you knew you had to, there was a payday when you got home. That's what the imminence of his coming is. You think of all the scriptures that, that deal with our walk with the Lord today, they're all embraced by faith, aren't they? 
Some people think that we preach as Baptists, we preach this thing where you crack a whip and you make people. No, God doesn't want that kind of. He wants us to serve Him because we want to. There's a big difference, isn't there? Because He could make every one of us yield to Him, but He doesn't. He's delighted when we do something, I, I think, for marriage. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, there are passages in Scripture that are so profound, and God makes Scripture with allusions that we're all familiar with. Sonship is one of them. You know what a son is. You know what a joy your own son is to you. You know what a joy his son is to him, or your son's to your daughter, whatever. You understand the joys of sonship, of being a child. Well, in 1 Corinthians 7, Verse 33, he that is married careth for the things of the world. We're not supposed to love this world. It says you care for the world how he may please his wife. She's supposed to love me. I'm providing for her. She's supposed to love me. No. Well, yeah, she's supposed to, but you're supposed to love her. That's what, what the commandment is. But it says you actively look for things that will please her. Boy, that's harder when you're young and broke, isn't it? That's why if I buy my wife stuff, it's stuff she doesn't need. Stuff she doesn't need, like Ferraris. Okay, new guns, new guns. No, you want to please her. Every once in a while, I get lucky and I stumble on something that she wanted. But then it says the same thing for the wives. She cares enough for this world to please her husband. That's what the family relationship is. And this passage starts out with the love of God. We'll see him as he is. If you have this hope in you, you'll purify yourself as he is pure because you want to please your Savior. <clears throat> His love is something to marvel about. Why would he love me? Why would he love me? My grandfather told me one time, I never shut up. We weren't close. You'd ask a question, your dad would answer your question. That's criminal. Then Jonathan, one time, I'm telling on him, I might have said this the other day. I said, Jonathan, you're talking constantly. And he said, well, how is a little boy supposed to learn anything if he can't ask a question? That's just exactly like Jonathan. But, you know, the next generation is a real blessing to me asks every question, every one. You know, he purifies himself even as he is pure. We want to please him. Don't you want to please him? I would be thrilled to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, they heard, well done, good and faithful servant, whether they returned 10 and 10, 5 and 5. The one that didn't hear that was when he hid his talent and had nothing in return except the talent that he'd hidden in the earth and safeguarded away. He just wants you to give back what you can give back. And when you understand the love of God, you want to please Him. You want to please Him. If you purify yourself, you'll study what He loves. You'll study what He loves. I like Ephesians 5. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You know, that's as simple as you can get, isn't it? What he loves is the church. Why do you suppose the church is so under attack today? Because a terrorist goes after what decent people love. And I'm not saying God, Jesus is just a decent person, but he's the benchmark of love, isn't he? And he loves the church. And so the devil is happy to wind up people that are only religious, don't have a walk with God, don't have the joy that comes in serving Jesus, don't have the security that comes in that. Uh, none of those things. In fact, uh, many of the people in this world believe that God is a God that's angry with them all the time. Well, I wasn't angry with my sons all the time. Oh, you don't like behavior sometimes, but you love them. And... Our Father loves us, and if you study what He loves, He loves the church. He loves when His children are in agreement. 
I remember my poor mother saying when I'd ask her what she wanted for her birthday, I just want you kids to not to, I just want you kids to get along. She was probably talking about Karen and me. Okay? I just want you to get along. That should be easy enough, shouldn't it? And yet churches are under attack today. More and more and more. And there is every excuse given to men, but not by God, to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And what does God love? Not just the church, but God's people coming together. A place for worship, yes, but a place for service as well. He loves harmony. Now, I commented to that singing group last week. I said, man, you guys' voices all blended so nicely, didn't they? What's wonderful harmony is when uh, brothers and sisters sing together. For some reason, their voices often blend well together. Their voices blended greatly. That's in the sing in the music realm, what God loves of His people. He loves us to dwell together in harmony you know, with a sweetness of spirit. On the contrary, He hates when someone sows discord among the brethren. By the way, that's one of the people He hates. Someone that sows discord. The devil likes to get in the midst of that. You notice husbands and wives actively try to pre, uh, please each other, as I just said. Actively trying to please each other. What a joy that is. The Bible says, Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. In other words, we just try to be like him. We just try to be like him. Children, boys, try to walk like their dad. Boys try to do the same things dad does. Boys try to behave like their dad, and, and that's why if dads aren't obedient to the scriptures, you're teaching your boys the wrong things. He, uh, he is pure. And the Bible says that that'll be where heaven is, uh, what we know of heaven. It do, in verse 2, now we... Uh, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. Heaven is obscured to us. We have some hints about it, don't we? You know what I do know about heaven? <laughs> John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I can't even imagine what a mansion designed by God is going to be like. Can't even imagine it. Some of these new versions say an apartment. Well, that takes a whole bunch of the joy out of it, doesn't it? Like, that's the best he could do. Man, we're on, we got budgets, you know. A mansion in heaven. So many people today don't even have a place to call home. Pick a good bridge and live under it. In the winter, don't pick Montana. Okay. I know that in heaven there's a mansion waiting for me. I don't know if my name's on the door. doesn't matter. The Bible tells us in Revelation 7 and in Revelation 21 that God wipes away all tears from eyes. There are people that bear the, the sorrow of a loss for the majority of their life. Think about that. could be 20 or 30 years or 40 years. It might be what happened in World War II, as I've shared with you before. It might be what happened when you were a child, but I remember when I was a kid in high school, one of my friends, his older brother, his older brother, had an accident where a shotgun went off and killed a little kid that was um, at the house at that time. I can't imagine ever trying to get over that. And the devil would keep that in front of you and say, you can't be saved, look what you did. But there's sadness in this, in this life, isn't there? There are dreams that aren't realized. There are heartbreaks that you have to live with. There are disappointments you bear. There are difficult times that you have to endure. And yet, <coughs> every tear is going to be wiped away from our faces. And it's not like they're just going to dry out. He's going to wipe them away. Isn't that an amazing place? When I think of hell, I don't think of the hell that the world likes to dream up. Well, all my friends are going to be there. You won't know it. You won't know. You will just know, as in Luke 15, 
that you don't want your family to come there. It's that horrible of a place. But in heaven, can you imagine heaven? In a, I don't know what it's going to be like. I have some pictures in my head. Can you imagine going and singing with this group, people singing praise to God? Then you go and pick this other one. The kids show me recordings of, what is it, 10 tenors? 10 tenors. Now, the tall guy on the end, when I was playing the trombone, I wasn't very good, but I kind of developed a little bit of an ear for music, and I'd hear people singing, and I'd try, and it's harder because I don't hear very well anymore. I'd try to figure out which one's singing which part, and I'd listen and watch their lips and all that. I realized that guy had a beautiful high tenor. And he says he usually can't sing high tenor because he has to preach too, and it's too hard on his voice. But uh, So sometimes in heaven you might go and sing with tenors. Other times you might want to go and sing with the basses. I don't know what heaven's like. I just know there won't be anything to be sorry about after he wipes our tears away. I can imagine the tears in heaven being because we didn't surrender when we should have. We fought him when he convicted us. We resisted the Holy Spirit of God so many times. We didn't do what we could have done to serve him. We didn't have a burden for souls like we should have had. And what, God, what this means to us is that God brings those thoughts to an end. There's closure. And all of heaven then is rejoicing. Won't that be wonderful? God wipes away tears. Revelation 21 says, God makes all things new. Who doesn't like something new? Who doesn't like something new? He's going to make everything new. There's a smell with newness, isn't there? There's a smell with it. He makes all things new. 21.6 of Revelation, you have access to the water of life freely. Think about that. Think about that. When we were in OMAC, just Nor and I were there uh, back in June. We went to the place I grew up in, and I asked if I could get a drink out of the faucet in the backyard. She gave us a glass, and I went out there and turned that faucet on, and I remember that water being the best water I've ever tasted. It still is. came from a dug well. A dug well it was about this big around, and it wasn't quite deep enough. My dad bought a big rolled steel tube, dropped it down in the well, and then he went down there and dug it out, and we pulled the things out by buckets. That's what you did in the old days. That water was terrific. Cold. It was great. My mouth's watering even now. But it would pale by comparison to the water of life. The tree of life is there bearing its fruits. Just think about it. Why in the world does God give so many different fruits, a grape, a pear, a peach? Peaches were designed to be eaten with cream and honey. They really were, okay? The, all these things, these glories in heaven, Romans 8, 17 says, were joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? Everything he inherits, we'll inherit with him. Incredible. Revelation 21 and 22 both say there's no night there. There's no night there. Then when we would like to have, at least in the flesh, we'd like to have a nap, we don't have to sleep there. You won't be tired. Praise and honor and glory will keep on going. You'll always have the vision of Jesus. All those things are precious promises to us as sons of God. And it says... What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. The fact that we're called sons means God has so much love that we can't even describe it. He, makes a, he brings us into the sweetest, most blessed fellowship you can have and understand in this life, isn't it? You look, when I, when I gave away Lisa... I really had to think at our wedding day, which was 11 years ago, almost 12 years ago. I was walking her down the aisle. Then I, what do you do? I mean, usually it's the dad and mom give her away, but I couldn't stand there and give her away and then run up in front and then say, okay, I'll take you, you know. So I addressed the crowd then, and, and it occurred to me that daughters are precious. You know, sons, your strength. Your daughters are your weakness. 
And there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. And I spoke, I addressed the fact that, that a couple gets married, they love each other, and a man can't help but see the reflection of his wife, the love of his life in his daughter. That's why they're precious. And you see that reflection, and she reminds you of your wife. And that's what you're giving away to some other guy that you don't mind going to prison over. You don't mind. And what a joy that is. And that's the kind of love that God bestowed upon us that we could be called children of God. And when you have that hope in you, you want to be just like him. Just like him. As a child wants to be like his daddy. Just like a child. Isn't that right? That's just, that's one of my favorite passages. Let's pray.